Another animal law, pigs seem very happy. They roll in the mud, they eat a lot of food. Are pigs treated okay? I mean, as far as uh, pigs go, and really I think you could extend this to all the animals, uh, other animals, uh, sheep and lambs and, and other animals, they're, uh, they're treated as units. Um, they're, uh, you know, you, you can just watch uh, undercover videos of the shameful, uh, I think to our society, the, the abuse of these animals. Um, there's something called packing them if they're, if they're not at the right um, weight, for example, in, in, in farm operations, they'll pack them, PAC, P -A -C, it's, it's an acronym for pound against concrete. So they'll just take the small pigs that are too small uh, and they'll pick them up by their hind feet and they'll just pound them against the concrete uh, to kill them. Sometimes and, called thumping, it's yeah. an industry term. And the interesting thing, people really complained about that and made a, kind of a big stink about it. And so, so, so in order to try to save face, the pig, indus the pig industry, uh, decided they wouldn't do that anymore, but they couldn't find anything else that was less cruel and violent than that. So they've gone back to that again. They've, they tried other things, but no matter how you, to, you know, to kill it, killing an animal um, because you just want to kill them uh, is, is violent and there's really no way around that. And so these animals, again, uh, suffer just uh, from hyper confinement. They've, they're they're hyper-confined, they can't turn around, they suffer from being, being impregnated over and over again, and then their, uh, their deaths are, are extremely painful. Maybe the only time they ever see fresh air is the, is the time when they're on the truck going to the slaughterhouse. Very often they're shipped in extreme heat or extreme cold. I kind of hate to say all this stuff, it's like such a bummer to hear all this, you know, it's like who wants to hear all this? But, but it's true. I mean, the, the fact is that, like in freezing weather, these animals will, fr will literally stick to the sides of the trucks, and the workers will just pull them off. And sometimes they'll leave a leg, you know, attached to the truck or whatever. It's just, um, it's just they're not seen as beings. They're seen as meat already before they're even killed. So uh, when you have a situation with in, in, in a modern um, industrial operation that's based on uh, minimizing uh, costs, uh, the animals really uh, suffer in ways we can't even imagine. And finally, uh, how are cows treated? Not dairy cows, just cows for meat, how are they treated? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's interesting because most people, when they're cutting back on meat and they're wanting to make change, they'll cut out beef first or red meat first. Uh, well, cows kind of arguably have it the best, really. I mean, the, it, it's still horrible. All these things that we're talking about, you know, uh, can occur to cows. Uh, but cows that are raised for beef... I mean, they still are dehorned, castrated without anesthesia. There's still horrible manipulations that happen to them as well. Uh, but, you know, they go to slaughter at a very young age. They don't have, though, all the horrible things that we have talked about with the dairy and egg industry. It's interesting, there's a, um, uh, a quote from uh, Ingrid Newkirk uh, of PETA. I'm not, uh, uh, well, uh, I'll, yeah. I don't love PETA, I don't hate PETA, I'll just say that. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I love Ingrid Newkirk's quote, and that is um, that if you want to cut out uh, animals, uh, animal products in, in the order that the animals suffer most, you should cut out dairy and eggs first. And that's very rarely how people do it. Uh, they'll go from red meat to chicken to dairy. and So, you know, so, I mean, it's arguably, of course, these cows are still treated horribly, brutally slaughtered. All, a lot of the things we were talking about still occur with cows, um, but yeah. I guess let me uh, wrap up then with a final question. Um, I guess my final question is, um, do you eat animal products and why not if you don't? <laughs> Um, I don't eat animal products, and the way that I like to think about it is that 
Because we know that virtually all the animals raised for food in this country, 98 to 99 percent of them, come from factory farms, and because we know that those conditions in factory farms are miserable for those animals, we know that the, that the animals spend their entire lives in conditions of suffering and misery, and then they die a violent death. And if anyone's been at this conference for the past several days, they've heard a lot of doctors and dietitians talk about the fact that you don't actually need animal products as part of your diet, and if anything, you should avoid animal products. I don't, I don't, I don't need to, to eat animals, and, and in fact, when I engage in discussions with people like my brother, for example, who likes to eat animal products, if I offer him some vegan lasagna, he'll say, that's really good. You know, it's got like vegan sausage, vegan cheese, it's all organic. He'll say, that's really good. That's like a 9 out of 10. And the only thing that would make that a 10 out of 10 is if it had real cheese and real sausage in it. Now, when I hear that, what I'm hearing is somebody saying, in order, for me to, in order for me to be really amused for the three or four minutes that it takes me to eat my meal, it, an animal has to spend his or her life suffering in misery and then die a violent death. Otherwise, I'm not adequately amused. And so that's why I don't eat animal products. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I always say the best decision I ever made in my life, besides marrying my wonderful wife, Madeline, <laughs> is going vegan 35 years ago. And uh, the um, underlying reason for me doing it then is really the same now, is I, I just uh, can't tolerate the idea of contributing to the suffering of these animals. And it's very interesting, I think, when you look at the this whole range of um, like a, a sk the scale, right? We have on one side of the scale, we have the, uh, what we've talked about at, at this panel, which is kind of painful to talk about, the, the sheer abuse uh, of animals. We have the environmental devastation, we have the health problems, we have the cultural devastation and war and, 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 and all of that that's connected with animal agriculture. And then on the other side, we have, well, it, I just like how sausage tastes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how do you, how do you equalize? You can't equalize that, but uh, we can, I think, begin to awaken to the fact that we're engaging in robotic behavior if we're eating animal foods. We're sort of programmed into something at a very deep level that is uh, very difficult to question. And so I think the, the, the most important thing in, in all of this is, from my point of view anyway, is not to cultivate a hatred. Uh, or even anger at the industries that are uh, engaged in these behaviors or the uh, individuals, even if there are people we know who are taking up their wallets and voting for it and paying for it. Uh, it's really to understand that this is a system that has been going for you know, eight or 10,000 years. We're born into it and uh, the, the underlying uh, insanity of it in the sense of the sense that it, we all have, I think, that it's uns not only unsustainable, but it, it really is a manifestation of a, a sense of fundamental disconnectedness from what we're doing, and that we can actually make a huge difference in the lives, not only of animals uh, and wildlife, but really in the life of our culture, that our culture can no longer continue on this path of, of shutting down our awareness, of going unconscious, of looking at beings merely as objects to be used. And it's going to be seen more and more as something that's absolutely intolerable. And I think this is really the good news. You know, for example, with secondhand smoke, remember secondhand smoke? Uh, I mean, actually, before secondhand smoke, remember there was, people smoked, right? And people smoked because they wanted to, right? It was a personal choice. I like to smoke. And I remember when I was a kid in the 50s, doctors recommended it. You know, if you're stressed out, just have a cigarette. I smoke a camel. You have, the, you know, have these camel ads for doctors. And then secondhand smoke was discovered, and now it's a whole different thing because if you're smoking, 
it's a choice for yourself, but you're harming others. You're harming kids or other people who are in the same space. And then they discovered third-hand smoke, which is, you know, even if you go into a room where someone smoked, it's the, the drapes are exuding these toxic chemicals from this person who was in there smoking. So it's been banned. And the amount of smoking has really decreased, especially in the United States because of this. And, it's, uh, and so the corporations are going to other countries. They're going to Africa and Asia and other words to try to sell their wares. But this really has become much more conscious. We've been much more consciously aware of it. And so I think what we're seeing in our society is a, mo a similar movement with meat and dairy and eggs that it's not a personal choice. People have wanted to say it's a personal choice. I just want to do it. But it's not, a, you're harming, I mean, the, like I said, you're harming, you know, ecosystems, water supplies, global warming, uh, the insurance rates of everybody are go higher because you want to eat meat. You know, I have to pay for that. I have to pay for your heart disease and your obesity and your diabetes. We have to pay for that in, in loss production. And the poor animals pay the ultimate price. And, you know, you would never find someone uh, raping someone and saying, well, man, that felt good. That, that gives me reason. It really, I really enjoyed it. It was good. You know, it's like, no, you go to jail. So um, we are going to be, we're getting to the point now where we're, I think, getting to, to the realization that these beings' interests are as important to them as, my, as our interests are to us, and we have absolutely no ethical or uh, any other level where we can justify cruelly abusing them merely for tradition or for taste or for any other reason, that, that they have the right to live their lives. And uh, this is the great liberation that is coming for us, I think, as human beings. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've been vegan for 25 years, and my reasons, you know, it's what we've been talking about for the last three hours. Uh, for the animals, I actually went uh, vegan initially for the environmental reasons. I was an environmental activist and then slowly I shifted, uh, the animals kind of called me to them, the farmed animals, and I shifted my uh, focus to the ethical issues. Uh, but you know, I'd, I'd, I'd really just like to end um, on kind of a, 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 a positive note in that, um, you know, I've seen such amazing progress, so much wonderful change uh, in the last 25 years since I've been uh, in this. You know, 25 years ago when I went vegan, you had to want it. You really had to want it. You, you know, there wasn't, the only soy milk I could find was powdered soy milk and you added it to water and it was chalky and nasty. And, you know, if you wanted a cookie, you had to bake it. I mean, there was nothing. And it's really amazing now, the abundance of vegan food comparatively. I mean, now there's, you know, we just went to the Whole Foods here in Orlando and there's more vegan food at this Whole Foods in Orlando than there is in the one in California I go to. There was a vegan jelly donut. <laughs> I was like, really? You know, so it's amazing how far we have come. And I think that, you know, as re really ultimately, this is a, a justice issue, a social justice issue for these animals. And when you compare to other justice issues, uh, the civil rights issue, child labor, anything like that, we've come so far in just a really short amount of time. We're on a great trajectory, a great momentum. So we just have to really keep it up. Um, one thing that I think is important to recognize is um, we have so many people that go vegan, but a lot of them slide back, and a lot of them go back to eating animal products. And you know, when polled, if we can, um, you know, believe these studies, uh, and and I think that it's true, a lot of the reasons are um, social and, you know, social pressures and, and convenience and not being able to find the vegan food. So I really encourage everyone to, you know, to create a, a, a society, a, a vegan society, create, um, you know, places that we go to gather the potlucks and events and things where we can connect and feel supported, like you feel that you are in community. Because often when we go vegan, we make these discoveries and we're telling our family and friends and we think you know of course they're going to be they're going to be just as amazed and horrified as me and they're not <laughs> you know and you're kind of like oh and you start feeling very alone um, so it's important that we connect 
as vegans um, and find our new family and our new friends um, and, and feel supported uh, and, and, and really find your way that you can reach out, that you can be a part of making this information available, whether that be talking to family and friends or possibly online or maybe some other way with your local uh, vegetarian or vegan organization. Feel connected because that's where we're gonna keep it going, keep it strong, um, and, uh, and, and, and really gain the numbers. Um, so, but, but we are, don't, you know, I know it's a lot, we just heard so much intense information, and it is heart-wrenching, and it is um, angering and frustrating and all of that, but how, you know, try to have that, go through those stages, but transform it into empowerment, transform it into action, and, and really help and go forth and um, you know, find your niche where you can make a difference for these animals. Um, you are now their voice. And we can do this, we really can. I believe very strongly that in just a few generations, um, it is absolutely possible that we could have a vegan world, a vegan society. Um, if you go back 200 years, um, or I, I'm actually not good with hundreds of years, but a few hundred years, and uh, asked people, um, you know, uh, uh, Oh, you know, do you ever think that um, that slavery will be eradicated? Well, you know, I think we can treat them better. Sure, we can we can treat them better, but I don't know. It's just so ingrained in the society. You know, it's so part of our economics. I don't think it'll ever really, um, you know, be eradicated. Maybe we can change it. Maybe we can make it better. But I don't think we could ever really, you know, uh, uh, eradicate society. And of course, I'm saying you would ask white people <laughs> at that time. And so now, fast forward if just a few hundred years and see how radically our society has shifted our views on that. You ask anyone about slavery, and in, at least in the US, and of course there is still a subculture of illegal slavery, I don't want to diminish that, but as a large, larger society, we have shifted those views. No, my gosh, we could never own another human being. How awful, how terrible. That was a, a, a blight on our history. This can happen. This can happen for animals. My uh, husband, who's a co-author on my book, I'll just finish with this, he has a beautiful um, vision that he uh, said uh, at one point. He said, I see in the future uh, a father talking to his son and the son saying, well, why do we call this chicken? What, why is it called chicken? And the father says, well, you know, it used to actually be made out of chickens and not plants, you know. It, it used to actually, used to actually kill the chickens and eat, eat them. And the child is horrified. He says, what? What, how can this be? This is the world we want to create and we can. So, thank you.